Okay, so hopefully it's projecting. All right, so this is Math 409 problem solving, lecture 29. Okay, it is not uh, sharing the screen, so let me just reset it. It has been asleep too long. And so we just saw a nice presentation of you're trying to calculate a certain area. Let me paste the problem. So here's the problem. So we want all the points closer. Oops. All the points that are closer to the diameter of a circle of radius one. So here's my horrible circle. Here's the diameter. And then what was noticed is that, you know, if we look at the points, it's going to be, it was a really clever observation that it has to be a parabola. And we want to find the area under the parabola. And like most good geometry proofs, you have an auxiliary line that's drawn at some point. And the parabola is all the points that are equidistant from a fixed point and a line. Does anybody remember what the fixed point is called? Okay. The focus and the line, directrix. I somewhat remember these because I had to go through them recently with Cam and Kayla when they were doing algebra too. And so um, it's something like y equals one over four p x squared. If you have, does this look familiar to anybody? All right, so this is a senior seminar. This is our last chance to fill in gaps. We will fill in gaps from algebra two. All right. Um, I assume that you do not mind if I make my life easy and take like the directrix down here, the point up here, and we'll make things very nice. So let's call this distance here P. And then we're going to have a parabola. So it's going to be all points that are equidistant from some fixed point P and some line. And so I'm going to make my life easy. This is going to be something of the form y equals a x squared. And all I have to do is figure out a. Do we all agree a is just going to be a function of p? Do we know any points on the parabola? Well, I, I haven't told you what a is as a function of p. So is there any point you know must be on this parabola? Yes. So we know. 0, 0 is on, OK? Basically, I've already used the fact that I know 0, 0 is on it to write it like this. OK, so let's look at some other points. Well, a natural point to try, um, so how should we think about things? You know, if we come down here, what might be, you know, we, we draw the line from P to the point, from the focus to the point on the parabola. And then how do we figure out where do we go on the directrix? We just go straight down. That's gonna give us the closest point. What would be a really good point on the parabola to look at? I claim there's one, bless you, very natural point to look at. I'm sorry? Okay. so x equals one, y equals a, but we don't know what a is. So I claim that there's a specific direction that might be natural to choose coming from the focus. Well, if we, well, if we go down, we get the vertex. So going down is one of the two natural directions. What's the other natural direction? Horizontal, right? What if we just go horizontally? Do we know what this point is? I claim we know that point's coordinates. What's the y coordinate here? Not p. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yes, p, sorry. What's the x coordinate? 2p. This is p. This is p. So that must be 2p. Right? So again, always try to see is there a nice natural direction to look at? So we now have, when we substitute, we get P 
equals a times 2p squared. So p equals 4p squared a, so a is 1 over 4p. And I believe that's what I was writing before. So you again, formulas you almost never use. And instead of memorizing them, what can you do? Just derive them. And so when you're deriving them, you have to remember, how do I find what they are? Well, just carefully draw the picture, label the points. And as I'm labeling the points, you know, knowing the vertex is at zero, zero helps me a lot, but I still need one other point. And so the question is, are there any points that I can write on the parabola that are only gonna be nice functions of P? And with a little bit of thought, it's always, well, what are the nice ways to move? I can move straight down and I can move left and right. And if I move you know, right, I know this distance up has to be P, so then it has to be P down below, so the X coordinate has to be two. All right, as long as we're here just for completion, uh, ellipses, so I guess I should write parabola here. So does anybody remember the definition of an ellipse? Uh, the distance sum. Uh, so let's be given two foci and some fixed distance. The ellipse is a set of points whose distance sum the two points sum to the fixed distance. Right. So basically, let's call this focus one, focus two, distance one, distance two, d1 plus d2 is constant. Okay. And so there's a couple of natural points on the parabola. How many people, if you had to, could immediately write down the you know, equations for ellipses and whatnot from this definition? Okay, so I'm just making sure that this is something that is worth seeing. I am so glad I did this recently with Cam and Kayla. All right, so this is A0 and this is zero B over here. Well, and the focus, uh, we normally denote this distance by C. So that would be C here, and that'd be negative C over here. What's the distance to the point A zero? So sum of distances to A zero is what? So what's this distance here? A minus C, and what's the other one? So it's a minus c plus a plus c equals 2a. So we know that d1 plus d2 is actually equal to 2a. So d1 plus d2 equals 2a. Megan, even though this is not a Putnam problem, just the thought process of how do you attack something like this. Is there another point where we might want to calculate the distances and work with things? Yeah, zero B, it's probably the reason why I've drawn it. So if we have zero B, what do you know about the two gold lines? They're equal. So what must be their lengths? Good. Why A? The sum of them has to be two A. So we know that this has to be A, that has to be A. So we have C here, we have B here. So we can conclude A squared is B squared plus C squared. And now we just look at a generic point. So if you add a generic point, say X, Y, you get X minus C squared plus, whoops, whoa, I'm sure how that happened, um, plus y squared, that's the first length. And what's the second length? The distance from x, y to this focus is just x minus c squared plus y minus zero squared square root. And the next one is going to be x plus c squared plus y squared. And what does that equal? It has to equal 2a. 
So now what do we do? Square both sides. My kids are still talking to me, right? Does this look vaguely familiar? Has anybody seen this in terms of proving the formula for an ellipse? All right, so if we square, what do we get? We get x minus c squared plus y squared plus x plus c squared plus y squared plus two square root blah square root blah equals four a squared, where I hope it's clear what the blahs are. And I'll do, this is the blah with the minus and this is the blah with the plus. I will, when you look at this, x squared minus c squared plus y squared, x squared plus c squared. All right, so there's a lot of things that are going to reinforce. Some terms are gonna miss out. So we're gonna get a two x squared, yes? And we're gonna get a two c squared. And we're gonna get a two y squared. So is that, that's what the first uh, terms are gonna be, right? Then we have plus twice, the square root of the blah with the minus, the square root of the blah with the plus, and that equals four a squared. Okay, well, I can clearly divide by two. I'll get x squared plus y squared plus c squared plus square root of blah with minus, square root of blah with plus equals two a squared. What do I do now? I'm sorry? What, what do I do now? Yeah, this doesn't look pleasant. Is there an expert just wants to the form? We don't know that. That would only be if it's on a circle. It's, uh, okay. we're, we're trying to figure out the relationship between X and Y. What should I do now? The hint is we've already done it once. Square, what do I have to do before I square? Stuff. Move stuff. So uh, since you're saying move, uh, whoops. So there's that stuff. I'll then subtract off two a squared and it equals negative blah with a minus blah with a plus. Now I can square things. All right, x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus, you know, c squared minus two a squared squared. Then I'm going to have cross terms plus dot, 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 right? Equals, now when I square things out, I'm going to get x minus c squared x plus c squared plus y to the fourth. And then I'm going to have plus uh, y squared, x plus c squared, plus y squared, x minus c squared. When you look at this, okay, well, when I have x minus c squared, x plus c squared, and I expand that out, I get x squared minus, I get, x squared minus c squared squared. So I'm going to get an x to the fourth plus a c to the fourth. So a lot of these terms are going to start to cancel, right? And so now it's just a question of just doing all the algebra. The fourth order terms are going to all cancel. Fourth order all cancels. Will there be any cubic terms? We're gonna have any x cubed or y cubed terms. No, we're not gonna have any linear terms either. So we'll have x squareds, we'll have y squareds. Uh, could we have, well, let's see. We've got these over here. So we've gotta be a little bit careful about what's going on here. So when we expand this out, we're gonna get an x squared and x squared. So we're gonna have an x squared, y squared term, okay. Then we'll have a two xcy squared, but a minus two xcy squared. 
So no, it, it really does the, all the linear terms vanish. So we will have some x squared y squared terms here, but when we square this out, we're also gonna have x squared y squared terms as well. And so when you look at it, it looks like I think a lot of things are going to all cancel out and it should just work out in the end. So I'll leave this as an exercise. You know, once in your life, it's not a bad idea. Just go through, roll up your sleeves and just do the algebra. The question of course is, is there a better way to come up with you know, this formula? This is a real follow your nose approach. Uh, to some extent for a lot of problems, if you only have to do the calculation once, can you come up with a way to attack it where you will not have to worry about, I need a clever idea. I need to think of, I'm gonna put another line up here and notice that it's a parabola. You know, this is the second class in a row where we've seen some kind of divine inspiration. I'm gonna take z equals one, x equals a minus one, and y equals b minus one, right? If, if you don't see stuff like that, you're stuck. This is not something that you know, makes you happy, but it's really not that bad to just multiply everything out. Um, we can try to simplify things a little bit. We have c squared minus 2a squared. Well, c squared minus a squared is b squared. So if you wanted to, you could actually replace this with um, a squared plus b squared. If you wanted, to. oh no, I'm sorry, b squared minus a squared. Because um, a squared is c squared plus b squared, right? So I think it's just minus a squared minus b squared. So I think this is just minus, if, if you wanted to, minus a squared minus b squared, if you wanted to. But anyways, if you just go through, you can see all the fourth order, all the third order, all the first order terms are gonna vanish. You're not gonna have x squared, y squared terms. And so you should end up with just something involving x squared and y squared. Um, we have things centered nicely, so it's centered at the origin, so we don't really have to worry about it. Okay, any questions about this? So this is clearly not a great way to do the problem. It's algebra intensive. Another way of writing down the equation of an ellipse is, you know, I give you some matrix, one over a squared, zero, zero, one over b squared, x, y, x, y equals one. And this leads to the standard form x over a squared plus y over b squared equals one. And this gives us you know, a matrix way of representing what's going on. In the way we're formulating it, a and b are not equal. A is always the length of the semi-major axis. B is always the length of the semi-minor axis. And because we have the relation a squared equals b squared plus c squared, it does matter which one you call. So some people like to always use a goes under x. So this is an ellipse that's oriented along the uh, x-axis as its longer direction. Have we talked about rotated ellipses? It's just worth seeing this um, at least once in your life. And if you haven't seen it, I will take the right. Imagine I give you an ellipse like this. With what you've done in high school, we don't know how to write down the equation of this ellipse. But what we can do is we know linear algebra and linear algebra is all about choosing the right basis. So if I change from the XY basis to the UV basis, we know how to write things down. And then you would just get, you know, UV, one over a squared, zero, zero, one over b squared, uv equals one. And then how do I get from the xy basis to the uv basis? Rotation matrix. And so I rotate by some angle theta. So R of theta, so I'm gonna write down something that's wrong. So what, 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 what is the mistake that I've made? Minus. There's a minus sign. One of the two signs gets a minus sign. And the mathematicians and the physicists, I think, have slightly different conventions 
as to which way they want to do it. So if I'm rotating the x-axis, the x-axis, if I rotate by 90 degrees, goes to the y-axis, the y-axis goes to something that's negative. So if I take the vector 0, 1, that should be rotated to something that's negative. So I want the negative sign over here. And now this will take 1, 0 and rotate it to something positive. And it'll take 0, 1 and rotate it to something negative. So this is my rotation matrix. And I think it comes down to, are you rotating the point or are you rotating the axis? And depending on you know, if you're rotating the axis or rotating the point, I think it changes where you put the minus sign. Uh, for a lot of things, you just have to check and see which way things are done. I know when they do their spherical coordinates, they have, I think, theta coming down from the z-axis, whereas we use phi in the math department. Since I learned spherical coordinates from the physicists first, whenever I teach 150, I'm always constantly reminding myself, you know, it's, it's phi, it's phi, it's phi, it's not theta. So this is the rotation matrix. So if I give you something in x, y, this will rotate it to u, v. And so now what we can do is we can basically take, if we call this our matrix A, it's something like A, R of theta, R of theta, and then X, Y, X, Y. And so we first start off with X, Y, and we rotate it to U, V. And I think, we, I think this is the order we want to do it. And then we undo what, the rotation at the end. And so this will give you the general equation of an ellipse. And so it doesn't have to be aligned now with the coordinate axis. A hyperbola, just you know, to finish off the chain, uh, I won't go through all the stuff, is I give you, you know, two points again. And then the hyperbola will be all the points such that the difference of the distances is constant, I believe. Is that right? So you would look at um, the distance from, whoops, this distance and this distance, and you want the difference of distances constant. And it eventually leads to x over a squared minus y over b squared equals one, you can get equations for the lines in terms of the slopes and length. All right, so this is a quick return to algebra two or pre-calculus, depending on you know, when they were supposed to do it in your school district. Um, there are nice geometric formulas for all these. One of my favorite examples is when Kepler was trying to come up with his laws of planetary motion. He actually had the orbit of Mars as an ellipse but he didn't recognize it was an ellipse because the equation he got was not the standard equation of the ellipse he was used to. He goes, ah, you know, it's this oval shaped thing. If only it was an ellipse instead of whatever this is. But it actually was an ellipse, but he didn't recognize it. This is why I really want to emphasize that a lot of times, especially on competitions, their goal is to trick or to mislead you or to pull you down the wrong path. And so they might just write something in a slightly non-standard form and be ready for that. Okay. I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so if we take just two parallel lines, like the uh, line of uh, the vertical line shifted by one and okay. the vertical line shifted by minus one. Okay. It's considered as a general quantity because it's given by the equation like y minus one squared equals zero. So it's considered a quantity section. Uh, but how do we like- Wait a minute, y minus one? It's y minus one. Y squared, y squared minus one. No, no, no. Uh, Ah, yes, 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 with, 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 with. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. And so, yes, there, there become questions as to what do you consider degenerate conics? For example, two intersecting lines. Is this a degenerate hyperbola? Mm -hmm. But yeah, well, you can get this like first line by just slicing the conic by a line, by a plane that kind of goes through its center. But like, how do you get to parallel lines by slicing a conic? It seems kind of like you need to have some sort of like infinitesimal like shift, like almost break in this plane. Of I'm not, I'm not seeing how you get two parallel lines. Oh yeah. You know, to, to me, you'd be getting more than just a line. 
because as long as the plane is coming through, I, I, I don't see how you get just, I got, yeah. I, I, I can see how you can get two intersecting lines like this, but not two parallel lines. All right. Uh, so going back, were there any other problems people wanted to look at? Anybody else wanted to present any other problems? I have a question for the one at the bottom left corner. Okay. Could we just rearrange the order of integration and integrate from zero to y times square root of 12? All right, so let me just copy this problem. Okay, so here's the problem. So they're giving us that the integral from zero to one. And so we now have um, this integral. So what's the first thing you should do when you have a multi-dimensional integral like this? Plot the region. What's the region? Plot the region. And so let's look at the region. So here's the x-axis, here's the y-axis. So I fix y goes from zero to one. And then for fixed value of y, x goes from zero to y. So what kind of shape is that going to be? So if y is a half, x is a half. If y is one, x is one. If y is zero, x is zero. What kind of shape is this going to be? Right. Triangle. So you know I've got a line here, and then x is going from zero to y. Right? And so this is my region of integration. If I want to switch orders and I want to go the other way, what would it be? So now I would want to integrate. And now x goes from 0 to 1. I always like to put subscripts in my integrals so I know what is the variable. I don't need to because the order dx dy tells me the more things I write down, the greater chance that I won't make a mistake. So I'll write x goes from zero. What does y go from? Wait, uh, isn't, isn't the triangle like on the top left? Oh, did I do it the wrong way? Oh, sorry. Um. Right, sorry. So x is going to go from 0 to y. Yes, so it's going to go like this. And so now if we want to do it the other way, you fix the value of x. So this is the line y equals x, or we can rewrite it as x equals y. So what's the starting value of y going to be as a function of x? x. And it goes all the way up to 1. And so now you get the log of 1 plus x over x dy dx. So if we want to do this integral, what's the y integral going to be? Just 1 minus x, right? So we then get this is the integral from 0 to 1 of the log of 1 plus x over x times one minus x dx. And so this is the integral from zero to one of the log of one plus x over x dx minus the integral from zero to one of the log of one plus x dx, right? So the first part, we know what this is. What is this equal? That's just pi squared over 12. So now we are left with what is the integral from 0 to 1 of the log of 1 plus x dx. This is the same as the integral from 1 to 2 of the log of t dt. Yes? I just don't like to have the log of 1 plus x. You know, make it simple to me. So it's asking you, do you know the antiderivative for the log of t? So 
So if you know it, don't say it all. Just raise your hand if you know the antiderivative of the log of t. What do you think it might be? No, that would be the derivative of log of t, right? So it's what function when we differentiate it gives us the log of t. So one method to solve this is the method of divine inspiration. So just write down what the answer is. Does anybody have any guess? So if you, if you know the answer, don't speak. What, would, what do you think might be a good start for a function that might have derivative log of t? It's not gonna be right, but maybe we can correct it. So you wanna somehow get log of t. Can you give me a function where when you differentiate it, at least one piece is gonna be the log of t. It might have other pieces, Good. So let's try, you're wrong, but let's try f of t is t log t. And this is a great wrong answer. How do we take the derivative of this? What do we use? Product rule. So the derivative is going to be derivative of t is one times log of t plus t times derivative of log of t. So it's just the log of t plus one. So you're almost right. You differ by one. So we need to subtract something that has derivative one. Can you, I'm sorry? So yeah, so if we just subtract t, then we would subtract one, and now we would just get the log of t. So f of t is t log t minus t. So the integral from one to two of the log of t dt is just gonna be t log t minus t evaluated one and two. So it's two log two minus two. Now what's the log of one? Zero. So it's just gonna be minus negative one. So it is two log two minus two plus one is minus one, I think. So I think that would be the answer. So this is a really nice uh, function to integrate. At first, you know, it looks like we're in trouble. You know, I don't know a function whose derivative is log of t. So the question is, can you put in something and guess? And if you guess, can you then correct your guess? You know, if it's not quite right, can I modify it a little bit? So what if I gave you uh, your f of t is log squared of t? What would you guess? What well, might be a good thing to try? I need something where when I take a derivative, I get log squared t. It's okay if I have other stuff, I'll correct that later. I'm sorry? Yeah, just, just try t log squared t. Anybody ever read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Where the ship is about to blow up, so they just move into space. They go, what are we gonna do now? Hey, bought us a few seconds. You know, we'll solve that problem when it comes to it. Let's just start. We'll start with t log squared t, and we'll see what that does. So if I take the derivative, I get one times log squared of t minus, I'll get t times two log of t times one over t. So it's log squared t minus two log t. Do we know a function that has derivative log t? What function has derivative log t? t log t minus t. Okay, but I want two log t. So I'm gonna subtract off two t log t minus t. And now when I take the derivative, I'll just get minus two log t minus two log t. And so I just get log squared t. And so we actually found a function whose derivative is log squared t. So in general, f of t equals log to the nt and positive integer. 
Do you think we'll be able to find a nice function when n is a positive integer? What do you think? We just did it when n equals one. We just did it with n equals two. What might make you feel a little bit more comfortable? So we did it for n equals one, we did it for n equals two. I'm claiming that you can do this for any positive integer. What might make you feel comfortable with a big generalization like that? Yeah, do three. If you do three, four, and five, and it's still working after five, okay, I'm convinced at that point that we've got a procedure. Well, what you could do is you can start to try to do this by induction. Assume you have something nice for the derivative of log to the n minus one, and now show when you do this. So I would guess, you know, f of t is t log to the nt minus a correction. And that correction should hopefully be something in terms of lower. And you can see, oh yeah, when I take the derivative, I'll get an nt log to the n minus one, one over t. So I'll have a log to the n minus one, which by induction I know. So you can see that the induction is going to come through and work. All right. So this is a good place to start. I'm going to just leave it at the, you know, the list of the problems. So you know, for Friday's class, you'll know, try to think of a problem that you can present either from this or Project Euler. If there's something that you want to present, email me so I know. Um, I really like problem number three that looks fun with all the factorials. Uh, 11 looks fun with the rectangles and whatnot. All right, so this is a good place to stop. Are you doing 11?